El enlace está en nuestras redes sociales en este momento y solo deben entrar al icono globo y poner Spanish, español. Vamos a empezar en un par de segundos para darle oportunidad a la gente que se una a nuestros canales de redes sociales. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to La Clinica del Pueblo's live stream session of Dialogos for Action, or Dialogos para la Acción. My name is Rodrigo Stein, and I am the Senior Manager of Health Equity Initiatives. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and broadcasting in Spanish via our Zoom channel. Please submit your questions via the chat on your social media platform. On your social media platform. We will answer the, them at the end. Dialogues for Action is La Clinica's strategy to advance three key areas at the core of La Clinica's work. The first, critical thinking. Dialogues for Action exposes us to new concepts, ideas, and positions that can challenge, inspire, and motivate us. The second, the concept of healthcare as a human right. We like to use this space to engage speakers and audience members on what this can look like and the steps needed to get there. And the third, Dialogues for Action is a space that recognizing that achieving health equity for low-income Latino immigrants means confronting historical and contemporary socioeconomic injustices. Today's dialogue focuses on current strategies to address the pandemic and integrated post-pandemic health responses for Ward 1 constituencies in the District of Columbia, focusing on Latino immigrants. Because health equity implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential and that no one should be disadvantaged from achieving that potential, then guaranteeing access to healthcare services, including mental health, are fundamental. Likewise, strengthening our local networks and neighborhood organization improves community cohesion and fosters a sense of belonging. It is our hope that today's dialogue can illuminate and bring a unique perspective on these topics. With that in mind, please join me in welcoming Ward 1 Council Member Brianna Do and La Clinica del Pueblo's Executive Director, Catalina Sol. Council Member Nado, thank you for joining us today. Catalina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, y saludos a nuestros audio oyentes en redes. Eh, Council Member, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to this virtual space. We know that you are always and welcome at La Clinica, and we hope to welcome you again to our physical spaces sometime in 2021 but in the meantime we'll have to make do with this with this um, medium and i i really we're really looking forward to this dialogue but i can't uh really start without recognizing how much this pandemic has affected us um in in the way that we are working in our in our own homes with our own surroundings and how you know, the personal is political. And so I, I have to ask you, what what has it been like for you, you know, to be a council member <laughs> in your board uh, in, with your life all around you and, and your, your beautiful children uh, being oh. part of your everyday? Well, um, Catalina, thank you so much for including me tonight. I'm happy to be here. Um, as you can see, I am um, coming to you straight from the extra bedroom. And um, I am hiding down here because <laughs> During this broadcast, uh, two small children will be coming home from their child care center and making a lot of noise. Um, and so this is the best chance that you won't hear it. Um, 
And I'm lucky because we do have the ability to send our children to childcare during the day. Um, earlier in the pandemic, I was home with a three-year-old and um, very pregnant um, with our now five-month-olds. And uh, it was challenging to try to be working full-time and to engage her in the way that she really deserves to be engaged. I know a lot of parents are struggling with this right now. I see it in every Zoom meeting that I'm in, um, really folks juggling and trying to stay healthy and and work and keep their bills paid. So it's been tough, but um, I feel very fortunate that I have the ability to work from home for the most part and, and to put my kids in care. So thank you for that. Yes, I'm uh, actually hiding out at La Clinica right now. It's a it's a privilege for me to be able to come on site, and and I and I do think it's interesting how um, we used to want to work from home to take breaks, and now working on site is is where we can have that distance. But uh, it is it is just a wonderful testament to all of us as a as a city, and I think as a region that we've been able to to transform and maintain what we've been doing. And before before we get started with our dialogue, I also want to acknowledge for our viewers uh, that we met with you in your office, speaking of space, uh, while you were still putting up, I think taking down the old art and putting up the new mm -hmm. back in 2014. And it seems like it wasn't that long ago, but it really is uh, 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 the case that you're one of our, our our state's people now, right? Our state's woman for the, <laughs> for the district. Yeah. And I would love to hear your perspectives throughout this dialogue of uh, how, how your perspectives have evolved in your tenure um, and in your, in your sense of priorities for our ward and, and for the city, you know, that's, that's really where we'd like to start is um, what's, what are your priorities and you're thinking about what's really important now after your, after your, your years of service here in the district. It's a great question, and and you're absolutely right. It, La Clinica is one of the organizations that I met with first. I first got into office in 2015. I can't believe it feels like a lifetime ago because of all that we've been through as a community. Um, and just so folks know, Ward 1 um, includes Columbia Heights, Mount Pleasant, Parkview, uh, LaDroit, parts of Shaw, U Street, Adams Morgan, Mount Pleasant. It's, it's a really special ward. It's the most geographically compact ward. Um, and that's had an impact on us during COVID. Um, it's, it's the most diverse ward. Um, and that means that we have people from all walks of life, all racial and ethnic backgrounds, all ages, all income levels. Um, in COVID, it's meant that we actually have a lot of essential workers um, who are at higher risk of COVID. We have a lot of families that live in um, homes together in group settings that are more at risk of transmission to one another. I mean, these are things that we've, you know, that we know about our community that um, that has become an issue during COVID and, and things, you know, it's, it's one of the really important things um, that I'm thinking about as we address uh, the public health inequities in our city and in our ward. Um, I really have, I have the greatest privilege of serving as chair of the Committee on Human Services. Um, so that committee oversees really important issues like homelessness, like public benefits, um, like serving people with disabilities. Um, these are issues I'm incredibly passionate about and have worked on really uh, diligently for the past uh, four years now, I think, that I've chaired the committee. Um, but when we first got to know each other back in 2015, I um, it was in the context me being a member of the Committee on Health, which I still am and I'm very proud of. Um, but La Clinica um, has been such a leader in the area of serving our, our immigrant population, um, our residents of color, our Spanish speaking residents. Um, and that for me has been such a valuable relationship because I learned so much from what you learn interacting with your patients and clients. Um, so uh, it's been a really interesting journey so far. Um, I think the biggest change really for me from the beginning to now personally has been that when I was first elected, I was just a single lady living on 14th Street. And since that time, I got married, had one kid, had another kid, bought a house, you know, and um, through all of those life experiences have gotten to know different angles of my constituents experiences. And I think it has made me better at my job to be able to 
be in their shoes. You know, last year we went through the DCPS school lottery for our three-year-old, right? And until that time, I'd only heard about it from other parents. But, you know, having these experiences yourself, I think are really important as a representative so that you can actually be in your constituent's shoes, so. I think that's very interesting. I, I, I remember I've, I've been, you know, I've been at La Clinica for 20 plus years. I decided to stop after the, decided I was just gonna put the plus because Accounting. Yeah. You know, <laughs> after a while, people wonder if you have anything to say that's still relevant, but um, the, the, the moment in which I was considering following Alicia, who we work with, I mean, we work with very closely in the executive director position, I, I thought about that a lot, about whether as a mother of children, it would be possible to have this role. And, you know, and I would tell myself, Dolores Huerta had X number of kids, you know, like if she had this many, you know, but, but really truly, I think some of the decision making for me came down to, um, it has to be possible for people who are living the lives of the people who we serve to be able to to be in in leadership positions and give and at least facilitate giving voice to others you know at the table like if, if it's if it's not possible then there's something wrong right? with the way in which we can uh lead and uh, legislate and govern and so forth but it, it is very yeah. challenging i think that yeah. this this pandemic has been affecting uh has you know we've we've, we've heard this many times it's laid bare all of the inequities and all of the things that were already hard and how hard has it been for, for women to stay in the workforce during this pandemic and how hard has it been for our patient population to, to stay healthy and to uh, stay enrolled, you know, to stay in programs like the Alliance. And so this is, you know, of course, what we also want to talk about with you. And I think Rodrigo is going to help so, remind yeah. me about Wait. the name of the bill. <laughs> I can't oh, goodness, I yes. Right? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that connects me to uh, the first question that we have uh, for you, council member. And uh, what we want to know is, uh, can you tell us about the status of Bill B230890? And I know that's a, a mouthful. And I know we have uh, uh, audience members who, who are questioning the same thing. So if you could just uh, give us a, a brief update on the status of that, that bill and what it means and the implications for, for our community. Um, sure. You know, I never remember the numbers of the bill, but I assume we're talking about the Alliance Recertification Bill. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And it has a strange um, title name. And so we thought, yeah. let's just call it out by number. Well, and yeah. And even, the even that, that, like, let's talk about what we're doing. Like, you know, the public doesn't have to care about the bill number, but you, you members of the public care about what we're actually doing to help. Right. So we'll talk about that. So one of the things that Monica actually helped me with this is just a really good example of how important it is in my job as an elected leader to be listening to the people who are doing the work in community. Because what I learned from listening to La Clinica is that we have this great benefit for immigrants, the undocumented residents in the District of Columbia called the Alliance, but it's not really working the way that it, it was formatted. And so we started looking at how can we make it easier for people to enroll? How can we make it easier for people to remain covered? How can we cut down on the barriers it takes uh, to be recertified? These are things that impact people's lives because what we had was a system where in theory, there's health insurance for everybody. But in practice, in order to get your insurance and to keep your insurance, you would have to go wait in line at a service center twice a year for hours and hours. You might have to line up early in the morning as early as 4 a.m. to get in line to be seen the same day. And you might wait for hours and not even be seen and then have to take another day off of work to be recertified. And you can imagine for working people, that just isn't gonna fly. Uh, people were just becoming uninsured, which meant that they weren't coming to the doctor when they needed to, or they only would come when they were very sick. And the whole point of having an insurance program is that people should be able to access healthcare and stay healthy and be healthy. And that helps them and it helps the whole community. So together, we decided to change the law. Now, that sounds very easy. That was a simplified way of talking about it. But actually, it took us uh, almost five years to do this. And I know that La Clinica was working on this before they started working on it with me, so longer than that. 
First, we said, all right, well, let's change it so that you don't have to go to service centers. Let's change it so that you could get recertified where you get your care with your doctor. That was the clinic's first idea. And we also said, all right, let's change it so that you don't have to go in person. You could recertify by phone. Um, Let's change it so that you don't have to do it twice a year. You could do it once a year. So we had all these ideas. Um, We passed not one bill, but two bills, one that I wrote and one that council member Vincent Gray wrote. He's chair of the health committee. Um, And we passed them. And then the chief financial officer of the District of Columbia said, well, that's going to cost you $30 million or so which meant that the law was changed, but only on paper, because until you find the money to do it, you can't implement it. So we didn't believe that (laughs) um, and began working to provide evidence that it wouldn't cost so much money to implement the program. And um, to make a long story short, (laughs) um, the pandemic actually helped us prove our point when the, the Department of Human Services that I oversee decided not to require recertification of benefits during the pandemic, essentially saying everybody who has benefits can keep their benefits no matter what the benefit is. We're just not going to make you come in. It's too dangerous. We want you to stay insured. We don't want you to have to do an in-person visit. They did that for Medicaid. They did it for Alliance. They did it for a whole host of benefits. It didn't end up costing us more money like was predicted. Right. If we had implemented our bill, it would have been the same thing. And when we did this instead, it didn't cost us more money. So it sort of proved our point that eh, maybe the numbers were a little inflated. So um, last month, we finally passed, I believe, the last piece of legislation we need, an emergency bill that requires the mayor to implement our legislation. Um, and I last budget cycle even threw in about $8 million just in case. Um, the implementation costs more, but now um, you can, you'll be able to certify online by phone. You don't have to do it twice a year. It's going to be easier to enroll in the Alliance and it's going to be easier to stay enrolled and it's going to keep people healthier. And now I think where we go from here is improving the program itself and improving the things it covers. And I'm going to be looking to La Clinica again for advice on what to do on that. Thank you, uh, council member. I think that's uh, uh, that's very encouraging news and thank you for, for providing such an in-depth. Catalina, I think you were gonna. No, I was gonna echo the, 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 the recap and also your championship of the Alliance over the years. And you know, I think the, the role that La Clinica has been able to play in, in partnership with other health centers and with other organizations that have formed part of our Alliance coalition, you know, it's been it's been one of the longest coalitions that we've been part of. And, you know, the I, I, I think it's a very um, wonderful story that the district doesn't get enough credit for that, you know, more than 15 years ago, the city was able to put together its own funds to be able to ensure access for all of its residents, regardless of immigration status. And it, it's been kind of tragic that we've been, you know, we've been unable to build on this great visionary for thinking uh, to to just basically update it, right? So that it has the same uh, fairness and processes and comprehensive coverage that's afforded through other programs like Medicaid that are really designed for low-income uh, members of, of any community. But I think, you know, we've, We've had that frustration year after year of all of us, health providers, patients, uh, policy advocates, health centers, legislators saying, we, we, we can fix this and not, not being able to go there. Um, and I do think the pandemic finally made it possible to see that, you know, these dreams are possible, they're implementable, they're, they're, they're doable, they're necessary. Absolutely. Is it a dream that this is actually going to change? Is it? I, I, I sometimes I, I I was kind of shocked, you know, when I saw that the legislation had been passed, and um, and I, we're we're understanding that it still it still needs to be uh, supported with a uh, with the budgets with the with the mayor's budget. So we're we're wondering what we can really do to mobilize to make this the very last step, you know, so that we can stop talking about enrollment and start talking about updating the comprehensive package that the Alliance might offer and and really just, as you said, how to improve the program. Yeah, no, I mean, we're done now and you can, you can move on, do the next thing. Um, It, we, we've funded it um, between the work that I did for this, this fiscal year and the um, 
way we built in um, funding that where we can dip into the reserves if needed of Medicaid, mm -hmm. we're good. We're good to go. So start the next round of advocacy on improvements. I'm ready. Okay, I've got some thoughts on that, but I think that we might have some questions to answer from the. From oh the yeah, I see that. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I do have a, a brief follow up, and I, I know with uh, so much legislation being passed and so the, the emergency declarations, uh, I wonder if you had any idea or thoughts of. Uh, I believe it was in yesterday's press conference. Uh, when uh, the mayor was was asked a question uh, about the healthcare alliance and the progress, if it was uh, going to be carried over for vaccines, and uh, it seemed it got lost in the cracks. So I was wondering if there's your thoughts on that. How do we ensure, I guess, to keep uh, mobilizing and uh, keep uh, our voices heard for? Yeah, make sure we don't get lost. And, and let's give the mayor a break. She's under a lot of stress right now, so if she doesn't remember the name of every program every in every moment, I think we can give her a little bit of grace there. Also, as someone, a fellow parent, the small child, I know that the uh, sharpness of your speech depends very much on the sleep you got the night before. So um, in any case, so I, I think one of the, the questions she had gotten was about, you know, whether we're using Alliance to help people get vaccinated. I think it's a slight misunderstanding of how the program works because Alliance is insurance um, and it is administered by our MCOs, our managed care organizations. So we already have um, our Medicaid organizations helping connect the clients to the services and the vaccines, et cetera, and the health systems that they work with and our clinics. Um, and so it isn't Alliance itself. Alliance is like a program on paper, right? It isn't the Alliance itself that's going to help um, folks get vaccinated. It's our partners like La Clinica, like Unity, like the all the providers um, that. And and I do think um, it, the the key really is that Alliance allows us to be in touch with people. Right when people are on the rolls, that helps us connect um, and know that we have their phone number and we have their email and we have their updated contact information um, and we know what language they speak because of how they enrolled. And that that is really useful information that's gonna help us get everyone vaccinated. So much so, uh, I guess uh, we can tie to, I guess, two, uh, two topics, I guess, uh, talking about vaccines, but also envisioning what a future uh, post-pandemic uh, may look like. So uh, I guess the first uh, question I would ask um, is how can the clinic work with you to secure access uh, to the Alliance after the COVID emergency is lifted? And maybe next we progress more into talking into vaccines. Sure. Um, I really think that we've done the, the heavy lifting already now, um, and we can move to the next phase, really, of how do we improve Alliance and make sure that it provides the access that we need. I remember in some of our earlier conversations, it was, you know, are we doing what we need to do for um, mental and behavioral health with Alliance coverage, right? I think the answer was no. Um, and as we are exiting the pandemic, or even as we are in the pandemic, we know um, that there are deep, deep mental health needs in our communities. People are going through trauma. People are grappling. And when Alliance was created, it was really progressive. It was before the Affordable Care Act. It was before universal health care. It was this incredible thing that the District of Columbia offered and nobody else did. And it was better than, you know, some of the basic health care plans that were offered by private insurance. And now with the Affordable Health Care Act and all of the federal requirements for every other health plan, Alliance has fallen behind. And so I think we need to go and get Alliance now up to par with all of the other programs that exist in the universal health care system. I did very much like the language in the bill uh, in, that was around aligning alliance with medicaid because i think that's really the the I, I think that's really the uh it's really the language and also the concept that i think is going to help guiding us to think about how we improve the program because sure. uh we started talking about the gaps that alliance beneficiaries had for mental health issues some time ago as you know the you know that integrating behavioral health is 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 like a it's, it's a known and done deal concept already, right? And right. everybody's moved on from that. And 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 uh, the focus is on care management, care coordination, looking at your total health population and seeing how you can improve health outcomes. 
And so I think that uh, we we want to always keep that alignment with Medicaid as the as the gold standard, right? Of what we yeah. want to be able to match the alliance to, uh, rather than than setting goals that are going to be outdated, you know, in in a little while. But um, I do think that you know the the so, sort of like at the challenge, I'd say, right? As a as a as an advocate, community based provider for Latino immigrants in the district uh, that we face is we're in a city that's friendly to us, right? Like we're we're part of the city. It's a sanctuary city. It's a city that believes in universal health care and and um, has made so much forward movement compared to so many other places, including our our, our our region, right? And the and the people in our community that live across across the the quote border that's invisible in this place, um, but we we can get missed right we can yeah. fall through the cracks because we're so much better than other places we're nearly there with coverage you know we're 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 um we're a small component of the total cost of healthcare you know but then these uh these barriers come up that are um that seem insurmountable for such a long time i mean really a global pandemic should not have been necessary to be able to get to where we did just for enrollment just for six months mm -hmm. enrollment mm -hmm. so you know i wonder about the um, the ways in which we can keep up this this momentum when we when we quote are out of an emergency framework you know and and i do and i do think that this falling through the cracks because of lack of um I'd say not not support, but lack of attention, right? Or, mm -hmm. or, or, or all of the great system things that are happening. There's this outlier that you know that's happening with immigrants. How do we keep that? How do we keep that front and center? You know, I think. Yeah, you really know, one of the things that that I like to think about with that is, you know, we've done so much work with the Medicaid managed care organizations, and mm -hmm. as you said, you know, the the managed care model where you have your primary care physician, you have people that work with them, you have your behavioral health, but it's all integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing Alliance into the MCO system, I think has been a benefit because the Medicaid organizations that are providing care in the District of Columbia have certain requirements they have to meet for all of the people they serve, whether their benefit is Alliance or Medicaid. And what's great about that is it's not it does not um, benefit them at all to create two separate systems, right? Uh, a tier A and a tier B, right? It, it's better for them as, you know, uh, profitable. Managers of a benefit, yeah. Right, it's, it's to create to set up one system. system that works for all. And so that also lifts up the Alliance program, right? Um, and we monitor those programs. They have to do quarterly reports. You know, there are, there's a real good system for, and the DC Healthcare Finance Agency actually is really stellar at, at monitoring these programs. So I do think that that's a big benefit um, to how we approach these programs now. And, and it's been an improvement. Um, so, I mean, there's always, always ways we can improve. You know, the other thing I think about a lot is, you know, we are very proud of the fact that 97% of our residents are insured in the District of Columbia. 3% doesn't sound like a big number, but that's still about 21,000 people. And that's a conversation I've been having with our health director. You know, it's, uh, we were talking about the vaccine and I know we're gonna talk about the vaccine in a minute, but the question I had been raising was uh, all of the documentation um, that uh, um, is being advertised as needed to get the vaccine, I mean, it's it, all the promotional materials say, and bring your ID and do this and do that. And so, you know, I'm constantly saying, but you don't really need an ID, right? Because it's not required in the District of Columbia that you have an ID to access all of these benefits. And, and I keep asking the question, even though it's been answered, you don't need the ID to get your vaccine, because I'm concerned that the marketing materials are going to deter people, right? There are plenty of people that are used to not even bothering to apply for something when it says bring an ID. Those undocumented residents do not believe that this benefit is going to be for them if it says on there, bring an ID. And that's a problem. So I do think there's still gaps, um, you know, but we're working together on it. And, and I wanna say too, um, you know, we've talked a lot about our relationship, but there's a lot of people who've worked really hard on this as well. You know, you've mentioned the coalition, council member, uh, Gray, Vincent Gray, who is the chair of the health committee, um, has been a huge champion on this. And 
to me, um, as chair of the committee, has been really great in the sense that even with my bill, he's it's not just advancing his own bill, it's advancing mine as well. And we work together on the budget to get these things funded. We've worked on the emergency to get it done um, so that we can move forward and focus on things other than enrollment. Um, but we've really done a lot of this together and um, it's exciting to have a partner on council to not be doing things all by yourself as well, so. So uh, thank you so much, council member uh, and Katarina for, for uh, jumping into that question. Uh, just, uh, I would like to circle back before we get into the vaccines, because I know that's a big one, but uh, in terms of the, the gaps you mentioned, council member, and one of the, the gaps our community uh, uh, consistently encounter in different uh, arenas is uh, language access. We uh, specifically in service centers, over the phone. Uh, can you talk to us about any advances um, mm -hmm. aware of specifically in Ward 1 services for constituents uh, around uh, expanding language access services? Yeah, so it's really important. Those of us who care about language access, which includes me, um, those of us who are working to increase and enhance language access really have to be so vigilant. And let me give an example of what I mean. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the Department of Human Services worked incredibly hard to move almost all of its services online and onto an app. They closed the service centers because they didn't want people coming in person. And um, that meant that people would have to find other ways to apply for their benefits. And they got all the tech up and running very quickly. And, um, you know, they've been trying to do it for years. And then all of a sudden it happened all at once. But it was all just in English. And it wasn't as though they didn't plan to do other languages. Um, but it was going to take, and it did take longer to get things in other languages. And, and that's difficult. And I think we need to be reflective about that. We need to really analyze what it means about us as a government that we launch things that are only in English and then we'll come back later and do Spanish or Amharic or whatever it is. Um, and I, I say that not to disparage anyone because I know that everyone who worked hard to get those benefits available online and on the app worked incredibly incredibly hard, um, but we can't call it done or call it a success until we've we've fulfilled the requirements of our language access law, which, um, which does require us as a government to provide services in languages that they are needed in. And we do that based on surveying our consumers and understanding where they access services and what parts of government and making sure that those agencies have language access available. So, you know, while those benefits were still all available by phone and using the language line, um, it was some time before they became available on the app and online in other languages. Um, so, you know, I think it's a constant struggle. We have to stay on top of it. We have to be vigilant um, and we have to do better. And um, and I would I would imagine that the agencies involved in, in the new tech would agree, um, which is why they worked so quickly to, to rectify it. So I, I think of that, um, got off on a tangent i can't remember what the original question was but, <laughs> but that, that was important you're still there you're still there <laughs> language access yes <laughs> well um, i mean language access, access in general yeah. yeah so now we have the vaccine right it's going to keep coming back to the vaccine uh, rodrigo so you know whenever <laughs> there we'll have most of it so, so when uh, the appointments uh, yeah. first oh sorry sorry go ahead Councilman. when the appointments first opened for our seniors, um, and still now there's there's a mad rush every time there are some appointments available. You know that's a result of there being a scarcity of not enough vaccine for the District of Columbia and really anywhere, right? And then we're getting more each week from President Biden, and we're very glad for that. Um, but again, when you have new technology and when you have scarcity. Who gets left behind is the people who can't speak English or, or can't, you know, apply in English or who need assistance. And that's a problem. Um, and it's not just the tech, right? Also, we found at the beginning that even the materials that were being provided to the community, there was a lag in translation. 
Um, so the mayor would make an announcement about vaccines. And then a couple of days later, the announcement would also come out in Spanish and the Office of Latino Affairs would have it translated and put it out. Um, so I think that we have to continue to really be mindful. I mean, this is the same point that I made about tech, right? Anytime we are doing something, especially when it's important, especially when it affects someone's health and well-being, we really have to have our communications ready in all the language that are needed. And, and I struggle with this too. You know, I have, let's see, one, two, three, four people on my staff of nine who are fluent in Spanish, one who can speak passable French. Um, and then, uh, and so we, we're doing better than a lot of offices in terms of, you know, one-to-one -one contact. But, you know, even, even we can do better in translating our own materials and newsletters and things like that. And I think it's this, I feel that the, the information that my office puts out is really important. So I want to make sure that people can access it. That's one of the reasons I was so glad to be here with you all tonight, because we know that, you know, not everybody in community is just going to pop over to my website and read what we're doing. Um, a lot of times hearing from a trusted partner like La Clinica is a much better way for folks to access information. So we still have to work on these things. And, um, you know, I'm going to keep pushing on it. So I, I um, you know, I think that that's the, the result of a system that's defaulted towards privilege, right? And so that yeah. it's always, um, if, if we're not intentional and if we're not thinking about how we're going to create the system to, to redress the inequities, it will default towards uh, privilege to those that already have it. And I think that that is the challenge because it takes more time, more commitment of resources. Um, and we have the same uh, time issue at La Clinica with our bilingual materials because we, we do everything in Spanish and English and it takes twice as long. I mean, it just does. There's no, there's no shortcut. Um, and it is, I think of our board meetings, you know, we have a, we're an FQHC, 51% of our patients, our board needs to be made up of 51% of our patients. Our meetings are held in Spanish with simultaneous interpretation. We have to translate all of our board packets. So it's a lot of work, you know, it's to a lot of work and that's, that's it. That's it's it. The least resistance to not do the work, right. right? Exactly. And sometimes you just don't have the time, right? And so prioritizing that over other things is, is a real commitment. And I am uh, I'm reminded, I have the opportunity every month when I have the board meeting to remember how valuable it was to do that because the participation is so much more meaningful, right? And the, and the leadership yeah. agency um, has real meaningful input. But um, it's... It, that's the stretch here, you know, for us. And, and I do have to say that um, I'm, I'm really proud of the district's response. You know, it's, it's a leader. It, it's been a leader throughout this whole pandemic and we've worked really well together. And even with, you know, a, a highly competent system, resources, attention, collaboration, we can, it's so easy still to default, right? To, yeah. Um, yeah. The opposite of what we intended, yeah. of the opposite of what we intended. We've seen that all along, and I, and I think, I think I remember even with the with the with the rollout of the of the Affordable Care Act, right, and the and the marketplace, and the state exchange here in D.C. that we had the same issue with. The all of the information was ready to go in English, you know, and it took like it'll, the Spanish is going to come later. You know, maybe we should just start developing the material in Spanish first, you know, and then, and then the pressure for it to be available. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make this go so much faster, you know. Um, it, it's. I think there's going to have to, you know, some of the we're going to have to be. We're going to have to be, maybe trying things out differently the way that we are now with the pandemic because, um, that when we do, the results are different, you know. And there's no change without change. Um, but I do think we should talk a little bit about the vaccines because, as you say, people are, you know. I think we've been very pleased at like to see how much our community and our staff have been receptive to the vaccine after a lot of trepidation at the beginning, but it, there's a supply issue. You know, there's a, now there's a many, many concerns about when, when will we get people vaccinated? Um, and so I do think I see a couple of questions about vaccines, Rodrigo. I don't know. Yeah, and I just, Rodrigo, I just put in the little note, the private chat, because I don't know how to do this other side of things. Yeah. Can I just put, can I drop things into this other chat? Yeah, the, the coronavirus uh, default, uh, I think we could share that. Um, yeah, let's we'll share it. So, okay, good, thank you. So on, I, the on link the that we page. just shared is the um, vaccine 
program phases with tiers. So it goes through like, you know, when we're in this phase, these are the people who will be vaccinated. And when we're in this phase, these are the people who will be vaccinated, right? So okay, let's start with this. I got the first dose of my vaccine. I'm very excited about it. And it was offered to me as part of our continuity of government plan, meaning there are certain people in government that need to be able to function for our government to function. And I am one of them. Um, and for it was very exciting to be able to talk about my experience as a nursing mom getting the vaccine. And that, you know, when other nursing moms have the opportunity um, that they'll be able to see that I did it and it asked me questions about what it was like or, you know, what the impact has been. And um, so I did a little video and we posted that today so folks can see it. Um, but that is, it's really important and for leaders to stand up and to, to say, you know, I believe in the science behind the vaccine. I believe that getting our community vaccinated is important. One of the things that that I've been concerned about is, you know, whether enough materials in, in Spanish language that will encourage people to get the vaccine or enough trusted partners out there saying it, right? Because maybe, maybe for someone, it's not me. Maybe I'm not the person they need to hear it from. Maybe they need to hear it from Catalina. Maybe they need to hear it from Abel. Maybe they need, you know, I don't know who they need to hear it from, but and, and I guess, you need to be thinking about, right? I guess that ties uh, a, a perfect tie into a question. I guess this one directed from Catalina, as you were mentioning, council member, who are those trusted persons uh, to deliver uh, vaccine information? So Catalina, uh, can you talk to us? What has La Clinica's experience been with the vaccine rollout? Um, I think that um, just to say, generally speaking, for every health issue that we have ever addressed since we have been created, uh, we know that the, the trusted safe space and people within the community that are associated with it have been fundamental to, to every rollout of everything, you know, that, that we've ever done. So that doesn't change, right? Those are the lessons from... Uh, the HIV pandemic, the uh, insurance uh, enrollment, uh, Affordable Care Act, um, everything that we've that we've done uh, has been really based on our work with promotores de salud, con community health workers, people from community who are uh, trained by us and with us to uh, to be messengers and also to help navigate towards our services. So I think that that's that's work with. You know, it's, it's been an adjustment for us to have to do that under pandemic conditions in the virtual setting. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we had this year in figuring out how to do that. Yeah. But uh, the ability for us to expand our messages through some of these social media um, channels that some of us were not as familiar with or used as frequently, right? Um, but others did in our community has, has been able to maintain that principle, right? That principle of who's, who's drawing it. So it's not necessarily the, 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 the individual leader, right? But the, the agency, the community-based agency that's trusted. So um, necessarily my role as the executive director, but the provider, the, the community health worker, the therapist, right. the person that, that is associated with La Clinica, if La Clinica is trusted, will have more credibility. For our vaccine rollout, I mean, it's taking up all of our time, right? So I think that that's uh, as it should be because this is the number one response that we have as humankind during this global pandemic. You know, I, I love the dramatic and, and big words and superlatives and the pandemic gives me opportunities to use them all genuinely. You know, this, this is the challenge of our lifetime to be able to vaccinate our community and our world, you know, as quickly as we can so that science can help us survive this period. Um, so on the, on the sort of real world experience, um, you know, I think that it's been, a, I, I'm so proud of being a health center because we and all of the health centers that we work with in the district have just responded to every challenge, you know, so um, COVID is here. We're going to keep on figuring out how we can do services while socially distanced and doing remote work. How can we do testing? We've all done it in different ways, but, you know, we've either navigated people or done testing ourselves or figured out how to do testing and now vaccines. So um, all of us are doing it uh, on top of the work that we already have to do to keep primary care going, to keep mental health services going, to keep the operations going. Um, we 
have, uh, we're, you know, we're basically vaccinating according to our capacity, which is somewhat limited compared to other health centers. And, you know, we had some glitches at the beginning, but we've been, we've been successful in filling and in, in not wasting any doses, right? And we're, we're, I think after the first couple of weeks, right, where we were able to work with the health department in tandem with other health centers to figure out how to leverage the doses that we have for the community that we serve, um, we've been able to vaccinate a greater proportion of our patients, comparatively speaking. Uh, many of our staff are already vaccinated and now exchanging stories about second dose, I would say. Yes. I don't know if you've heard about second dose, but you know, these are um, these are huge milestones. I mean, it was December, at the last week of December when we even became aware that the vaccines were gonna be available. And that's-, right. that's I mean, that's it's amazing. Really, yep, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. amazing how much has happened since then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. we've had we've had the vaccine for what, uh, two months almost. Yeah. And, you know- I Demand outstrips supply, right? Absolutely, That's but, and yeah. we're, but we're leading the nation in terms of our distribution, yeah. right? And that is not about what happens at the health department. That's what happened about what happens in community, right? So, I mean, speaking it's about the clinics and the practitioners. I'll, I'll just uh, circle that question for you, council members. Speaking about community and the importance of, of uh, collaborating with community-based organizations for distribution, how do you envision uh, an equitable, a real equitable plan for vaccine rollouts? What factors have to be taken into account, specifically when members of our community have problems with language access, many are undocumented. Uh, if you can tell what a, a plan based on equity uh, we'll go for it for you. Sure. So it was very clear at the beginning of the rollout for uh, residents 65 and older that we were already starting to see an inequitable distribution of the vaccine. Um, the uh, distribution primarily through the portal um, meant that folks who were a little more tech savvy were the ones who were getting it. We saw disproportionate and wealthier wards. Um, we don't have the ethnic or racial breakdown right now of who's received the vaccine. That is data that we really very much look forward to having so we can do deeper analysis. But we do know by zip code and we tend to know um, we have poverty measures by zip code. So even if we're not doing race and ethnicity, we can do poverty. So that became an opportunity and council really pushed hard on this. It became an opportunity to um, target zip codes that were higher poverty and had lower uh, vaccination rates right out of the gate. I mean, I think that happened within the first few weeks. That actually had the impact for several weeks of creating some more balance. Um, it seems like we have backslid a little bit more on that. Um, now, this is like just 65 plus using the portal, but um, over time, the district has also added in our community-based clinics and health centers and health systems. And that's meant that, so La Clinica, Unity, Mary Center, Community of Hope, MedStar, um, Howard, they can contact their own patients and also with more knowledge about who their patients are, identify people who might be higher risk than others and actually you know, be really mindful and deliberative about who the vaccine is offered to. Now, these decisions are all being made in an environment of scarcity. And I remain hopeful as we gain more access to vaccine that we'll be able to vaccinate everybody who wants to have the vaccine. Um, however, I think, I think once we get to that point, what we're going to be looking at is who haven't we reached, convinced, um, partnered with? So what segment of the population is going to be less likely to, to understand or believe in the science and really need that credible messenger to say to them, this is a life-saving intervention. We care about you. We want you to be vaccinated so you can be safe, so your family can be safe, so our community can be safe. Um, you know, we've seen distrust in communities of color um, around the vaccine. And that um, is a big barrier to um, herd immunity um, and addressing the health inequities that already exist, right? Because those line up. Um, and so 
this is where the trusted partners come into play. Um, this week, we had the first faith-based organization launch a vaccine program. We have a church on Pennsylvania Avenue um, that is, is doing a vaccine clinic, um, which is really great. And we're gonna need more of that. We've also evolved in what we know about how to transport the vaccine. Before it was, we can only do this in controlled environments. Now we know we can take the vaccine on the road. We just have to be very careful with it. We have health partners vaccinating in public housing sites now. I mean, this program is now expanding in a way that is much more equitable than how it began. I, um, and I think we can be proud of it, but we're going to have to keep pushing. Thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, I do want to give uh, the last couple minutes uh, to address the questions we had in the chat. Uh, I want to make sure that we open this space right now for uh, as much participation as we can. So uh, the first question that we see is from uh, Nina Yamanes. Many undocumented individuals were the first to lose their jobs and thus their essential worker status. A vaccine could help them back can get back to work. Will DC prioritize the undocumented for vaccines? So great question. So one of the reasons I wanted to share the link here from the coronavirus.dc.gov website is so that everybody can take a look at the tiers um, and see when each population is being vaccinated. Um, undocumented residents are not a category or a tier, um, but what we do is we look at age, um, underlying health risks, and certain categories of, of work, right? So there are some categories of essential workers that are a higher priority on the vaccine list, and you can go through and look and see. Um, and we're also having a conversation of, uh, about which, um, which uh, professions have not been prioritized and which health conditions have not been prioritized. The health department is meeting tomorrow, I believe their committee is meeting tomorrow to sort of make some decisions about what constitutes a high risk health situation. Those, the, we haven't gotten to that yet because we haven't had enough vaccine yet to even get that far down the list. But these are really important decisions, right? What's it going to be based on? What types of diseases or underlying conditions or comorbidities? Um, and when it comes to workforce, um, you know, you can see on the on the document, um, you know, you've got people in healthcare, you've got people in um, certain uh, other essential jobs that are prioritized, but you also have some that aren't, and um, people who've been working all this time. So I worked with some colleagues a couple of weeks ago to get our childcare workers on the list. Um, and teachers had already gotten on the list, but childcare workers had not. And, and while schools are preparing, they've now reopened partially this week, um, last week, uh, childcare centers have been open the whole time, right? And the whole time, yep. Prioritizing those workers was really important to me, right? And those are often a lot of women, people of color, um, they're low, lower wage jobs, right? This is important. So the conversation is evolving, I mean, daily. And this is not even weekly, it's daily. Um, and, you know, the more information we have and the more vaccine we have, the deeper we dive on all of it. Um, I think we also had a question uh, earlier. Uh, I think it ties back to uh, the COVID vaccines as well. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you, know do you want to read it or should I read it? Uh, do you know if uh, we have a waiting list to sign for the COVID vaccine? Muchas gracias. This is from Jose Gutierrez. Uh, so there's not a wait list for the vaccine. We are working on a registration system right now, and that should be available maybe in the next month or so. And at that point, you would register, you'd provide all your information that helps the district determine what tier you would fall into. And then when it's your tier opening up, you would get a notification that you could register. But we're not doing a wait list. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. Yes, we, we have another question uh, regarding the next steps regarding the bills to decriminalize street vending, mm -hmm. um, criminalize vending zones uh, where sidewalk sellers could operate. Yes, I've introduced two bills. One would decriminalize street vending and one would create a, a more, a, a license that better fits the, the type of vending. And those are both waiting for hearings in the Committee of the Whole. Um, and one other thing I want to add too is, you know, we have this program for undocumented and um, excluded workers who don't qualify for public benefits or unemployment um, called DC CARES. Um, and 
we've added money to the fund and it's being distributed now the second round of it and everybody is eligible for at least one round of funding um excluded worker and folks can apply for that at dccares2021.org um, and that's a really important lifeline for folks who have been out of work and aren't eligible for the federal benefits um, I think there was one uh, additional question. This ties back uh, earlier to our alliance discussion. Um, and it's, uh, do you think if the mayor was more aware of the alliance, uh, would her, would her? Oh yeah, I think we answered that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to ask you about the the emergency legislation that was passed. Is that the emergency legislation? Was there emergency leg legislation that you passed with um, Council Member Gray? For the alliance that's separate from the legislation that was passed and funded regarding the um, right so the emergency yeah. that we passed in january is is the thing that finishes the deal the thing that finishes the deal okay yeah. so now we're done you can see i'm now still like really okay okay so i'm, I'm gonna go back and read that with detail no, that's a good one yes. you know, i mean i think yeah, yeah go, ahead. go ahead no i was just gonna say um i wanted to i asked that before I, before I lost my mind, but the, um, the 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 piece that I want to make sure I say uh, before the program is over related to vaccines and then just generally where we are in this moment is that things matter, right? I mean, I think that that's the we if we 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 want to be able to get to a a, a a moment where vaccine is available as fully as needed and on demand, and then I, I do think that we we all know that doing it through the through scheduled visits with your health centers is the best strategy for people that have a health center. Right. But that coupled with that same kind of access that we had with COVID testing in mass uh, or in public settings, but particularly in neighborhoods where those zip codes are, um, you know, it's, it's, we can get a lot of information from people to make sure that they qualify for boxes, but that's always going to uh, deselect out for people who don't even know that they're supposed to register, right? But we, mm -hmm to a building that we know has had all of those positive cases on, um, you know, in, in, in Columbia Heights, right. and up a vaccine site there and people will get vaccinated. We don't, we don't need to necessarily tie every individual back to a risk when we know that there's a community, a neighborhood, you know, a, a building that has all of those people that need the support, you know? So I think, and the other thing that I want to say is we are facing a huge mental health epidemic, right? I mean, that's yeah. the, silent, the silent part of this pandemic. Uh, in the sense that there's so much suffering and I do think that's going to play into people's ability to just be attentive, get up out of their beds or you know, just be able to, to move forward in those things. And the access for mental health, I mean, we have been, uh, we've been really um, amazed and fortunate to be able to maintain our level of services for both mental health and substance abuse services remotely, but yeah. we're waiting for mental health services now, you know, and, and our patients want more and need more, you know, so I do think that program improvements, expanding coverage, and also access to mental health has got to be up there in our, in our 2021 list. For sure. And I was just yeah. going to ask you, you know, like what else from your perspective can we be doing? How else can I help? I, I think you're raising some really good points. You know, the health department is is doing sort of the, the, the high level work. Uh, and, and for those who've gotten vaccines through the portal, essentially they're going to um, rec centers, they're going to pharmacies, they're going to grocery stores, they're going to places in the community to get their vaccine. Now, people are traveling, you know, because sometimes the appointment they can get is all the way on the other side of town. Um, but they're community-based settings. Um, expanding the program now, so we have uh, clinicians going into public housing. Um, the work that my office is doing um, where we are reaching out directly to senior buildings and saying, okay, who in your building needs assistance registering, right? And now talking about how do we do transportation? How are we doing all these other pieces? I mean, that's the stuff that has to be done in community, right? The health department can't do it all. We all are in this together. You're doing your part. I'm doing my part as a ward council member. Um, we have ANCs who are joining us and doing it. We have mutual aid networks that are joining us in helping connect seniors to the vaccine and will help us expand. And in my mind, what I'm doing and trying to lead on in the ward is building out that network of helpers so that when we have all the vaccine that we need, we can get it in people's arms. Yeah. We can just blow it out like that. Yes, that would be wonderful. Um, I don't know if uh, there's any other questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes left. 
there's no apparently there's no more questions. So, uh, Councilmember Nadeau, uh, Catalina, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, taking an hour of your valuable time. I know the community has benefited tremendously from hearing uh, both from an elected official and a community trusted uh, representative like Catalina. And, uh, we hope to continue working close with you. And I don't know, Catalina. Well, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to have this hour with you and with you, Rodrigo, you know, sort of facilitating. And I have to thank our interpreters who must have suffered through the last minutes of excitement uh, when we were supposed to talk slowly and not interrupt each other. So I, I uh, want to <laughs> mention them that have been, they've been uh, accompanying us all of this time for our Spanish speaking audience. And, and, I, and I hope that you enjoyed yourself too, council member. And you know, as I said, we hope to, be able to do this again in person at some point in 2021. Thank you. And as I said, please let me know how I can help because you know we're in this together and our partnership since 2014 has taken us so far and helped the community so much that I know we can keep, we can keep at it together. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much.